would you say that the quality of the food uh, was a source of dissatisfaction uh, by the soldiers, which led to some form of disgruntlement? As a military commander, I think we are always reminded and educated to take care of the welfare of our soldiers. Because at the end of the day, the feeding, the, 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 the accommodation and other aspects of the, the, the welfare, upkeep of the soldier is also very important. And uh, it, are, it is an issue which is very close to the soldier. So sometimes if there is any, any, any problem with that, it can lead to some sort of well, disgruntlement. You, you're, you're theorizing the issue. Uh, you're telling us what is in the textbooks, what your responsibility is. But tell us how the soldiers felt about how that responsibility was discharged at the time. Did they feel disgruntled by the quality of the food? Suddenly, they were not very happy about it. Fine. So let's now move on back to the issue of the housing. Uh, you said it was inadequate. Was that also a source of disgruntlement? Well, it was not adequate. And uh, as I said earlier on, because the army was a new phenomenon. So the, the only comparison we had was this, uh, the condition at Fajara Barracks, which was you know, built by the British during the colonial time. So relative to the housing at Fajara Barracks, I think Yundum, Yundum was, was, was not the first, but certainly could compare very well. Still, that did not answer the question. The question is, uh, was it, were the soldiers satisfied with the quality and quantity of accommodation that was available at the time? Again, I will repeat, the, the conditions were not adequate. Certainly, it was not a five-star accommodation. But the soldier in the field would endure worse conditions than that. Because if you are on operations, uh, sometimes you have to live in tents, etc. So certainly anybody making up your mind to join the army would therefore you know, be realistic and then you know, ready to live in the condition that was available. It was not a five-star hotel, but that was what was available. Yes, we all agree that is what was available. The question is whether what was available was satisfactory. Satisfaction is an individual perception. As I said earlier with the food, you know, it depends on what your benchmark is. But by and large, according to Gambian standard, then it was, it was, it was okay to my own mind. Uh, thank you very much uh, for that answer. Now let's talk about transportation. Was it adequate? No. Transportation was not adequate because, you know, in the military, we have what is called the table of organization and equipment. For every unit, there is a complement of vehicles and other equipment that goes with it. Again, it depends on if you have a battalion, you have troop carriers, you have uh, what is called uh, these uh, jeeps for the commanders, etc. So we, it was transportation was never adequate. Initially, in '84, we were donated some vehicles by France, which we use, and then along the line, through the advice of the British, we procured some Bedford second-hand Bedford vehicles from the British uh, Army. That was the commission, and uh, I think basically that was what was available then. Uh, would you say that the inadequacy in transport available to the soldiers was also a source of disgruntlement? Well, certainly, yes. Uh, it is frustrating to, to not be able to move around, to, to do your regular duties and training. 
How about the pay? Was it good? Pay has always been low in this country. As I stated earlier on, when I joined as a recruit, our salaries in 84 total was 186, which was after taxation, and then $60 was uh, deducted for, for feeding and other things, and then you go home with about 120. In, I don't know the price index of 84, but certainly, well, it was, it was, it was compared to other services and uh, what you get in other units, like uh, in the education, etc. Well, it it was it was it was it was it was it was within range. As at 19, well, we we have from your answers, it appears that the food was barely satisfactory, housing was not adequate, transportation was not adequate, pay was just okay, and all these did not were not recipe for very happy soldiers. Would you agree? Well, I think we could have, it could have been better. Um, what would you say was the view of the junior officers regarding the presence of Nigerian troops in the Gambia? or Nigerian officers responsible for the army? When the Nigerians came, I don't know the details of uh, their, the SOFA, what we call status of forces agreement between the government of the Gambia and Nigeria. But uh, I think they were, the, the officers were given some, some accommodation the NCOs were also given accommodation. The most senior officers had their own uh, private vehicles. Uh, the other officers had bosses that, and the NCOs had bosses that they, they joined collectively. I didn't know what their salaries what was, but there was talk that they were being paid in foreign currency. I, I don't know. But certainly, you know, it's normal when you move from, from your own country to another. I don't know who was paying, whether it was our government or not, but certainly there is an X factor in terms of your pay and allowances. So relatively, it was, it was, it was above what was available to the Gambian officers. But uh, were junior officers in Gambia happy with the presence of the Nigerians? Well, again, you know, when you use this terms happy, happiness, it is an individual's own perception. So I would say that, yes, ambitious young men, you know, who, who, who wants to scale up, you know, would, would definitely be a little bit impatient. And in the army, we used to have this term, when, an, when a young officer wants to look up too high, we say, we, we caution him to look down before he breaks his neck. So which means, you know, as a junior officer, you wait for your turn. So. And the Nigerians appeared to have been in the way. Is that right? Yes, yeah, certainly Nigerians were a benchmark to look, look up to. But, you know, we, we also knew that over time, well, we could, we could also attain such things. How about the ability of the Nigerian troops or commanders who were here, in particular the trainers? I was not privy to their individual CVs, but certainly if you, if you look at the Nigerian army training structure, where an officer would have to go through the NDA, what they call the National Defense Academy, for some years to become a cadet, then from there on you build up your career. By the time the, the, the lot that were posted here, most of them, apart from their professional military training, the officers, then most of them had a first degree in one area or another. For the NCOs, I think they must have served, you know, for a length of at least 10 to 12 years before they were able to, you know, excel within their own army setup and then being selected to be, to be brought 
to another country or taken to another country. So I think by and large, yes, they were qualified to do what they were assigned to do. Would you rate them highly? Again, rating them was not, <laughs> it was not my duty to rate them then because I think I would take it that, you know, if a sovereign state requires assistance from another sovereign state, certainly you will select the best of your, of your lot to post to another country. No country would want to send mediocres to another state to represent you. So they were, they, they were capable, in my own assessment, to do what they were assigned to do. Did you by any chance attend the training that was organized in Kudang in May of 1994? Yes, I, I attended the training. As I said, I was then a company commander. So the whole idea was what we call a field training exercise in which a company size force was, was, was designated and then you go through the phases of battle, that is the advance to contact, you know, reaction to enemy effective fire, then you fight through the enemy position, clear it, you know, with all the activities that go on, you know, of course, once in the process of fighting, you, you, you encounter enemy fire, then you make an appreciation, you read the battle, you know, uh, collect your, your, some of your, your, your forces to a secure place, and then after you read the commander, as the commander, you read the battle, and then give rapid operations orders, and then embark on the journey of uh, uh, defeating the, the obstacle. Yes, I was. Uh, you said you are the company commander. Who, who were your platoon commanders? If I can remember well, I think one of them was Yanguba Ture. Sana Sabale was one of them. I think Edward Singate. You know, because we had all the young officers and the, 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 the Gambian senior officers. So that the exercise troop were one. So that you will be given a particular phase of the operation or the exercise with which you prepare your orders and deliver them. And then go through it. At the end of which you are critic. You know, and uh, the teaching points were noted. You will be told what you did well, what you were short of, and then it could serve as a point to, to rectify or to, to adjust to. Who designed that particular exercise? I think then I was in, in Farafeja, but it must have been designed by the, 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 the colonel who was responsible for training and operations. During that exercise, did you sense any form of dissatisfaction or resistance on the part of junior officers from the Gambia? The exercise lasted, I think, for almost five days. We assembled at Kudang initially and then do the necessary preparation and then move to the exercise area. So as I said, I was one of the first to be exercised. After me, there were other, 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 other captains who were given similar tasks. So it was, it was, it was a, what we call an advanced to contact exercise. You, you, the, 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 the exercise started around the outskirts of Kudang and then ultimately ended up before, before this thing, Choya, or somewhere around that end. So of course, this was a dynamic situation as well. You know, uh, those who had similar sentiments and similar, this thing would call it together at the end of each exercise and then probably do their chit chat. The question was, did you notice any form of resistance or dissatisfaction by the junior officers? Quite honest, no. There was no visible resistance because each of them the role you were assigned to do, you were doing it. So, quite honest, I didn't notice any sort of reluctance or resistance to any of the instructions that were being given then. Did you learn of a meeting by junior officers wherein they discussed the quality of the training that they were given at the time? I think uh, after that, after the exercise, 
not before the July 22nd events, but later on we, 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 we learn that some of the officers, you know, had decided during the process of the, the night harbors or to, to, to come together and then do their own self, uh, their own critique of the situation and then came up with some, 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 some ideas. So, in a sense, you are telling us that you later learned uh, that the junior officers met together and discussed the training, correct? Yes, but not within the immediate, uh, during the, uh, the training or the immediate aftermath of the training. And the information you received, uh, what does it entail? What does it say about the training that was carried out? At that time, I will also state that, you know, the Gambia National Army had various countries where they go and train. There was always, you know, this competition between those who went to Sandos and those of us who were trained in America. You know, in Sandos, you know, the, the, the method was to train you as, from an, as an officer cadet to a, to a second lieutenant. In America, I think the, the courses we went to, the infantry officers' basic course, you know, was a little bit higher because they, they graduates from their, this thing, how do you call it, their military academies, West Point and others, were collected together and then given, you know, a, a higher sort of training. So we used to pride ourselves that, yes, we, we were more infantry, we, we were more skilled as leaders of infantry soldiers than those from Sandos who had the basics. So that was, there was various, uh, this thing, how do you call it, barometers with which to, to, to look at, you know, whether something is effective or not. But uh, the information you received about the training, you received the information subsequently that we, that we accept, but did the information you received suggest that the junior officers were not happy with the quality of the training that was offered while in Kudang? Yes, I think, yes, they, they felt that, you know, what the kind of training that were, we had received early on from the British was a little bit more advanced than the one we were getting from the Nigerians. Mr. Chairman, it's 10 minutes to the first break. Perhaps, uh, as agreed yesterday, it's about time that I cede the floor to the commissioners for any questions they may have. Thank you very much, Mr. Council, and thank you, <coughs> G General Cham. Uh, we appreciate your testimony. Are there any questions, Emma, from the commissioners? Yeah. Yes, Emma Bishop, you have the floor. Commissioner Jim Sodiko. Um, General Emma Cham. Um, point of, yes, um, I would want you to clarify for me, because I'm not too sure whether I, I got the figures um, correctly. Uh, the salary that you stated, was it $186 that they have been paid per month? The figure, the amount. Because you said, I think, they deduct $60 for food. So what was the salary? Yes, I stated that during our recruit training, the then salary after tax that a recruit will receive total up to 186 or 80 this thing, suddenly below 200, out of which $60 was deducted for feeding. And then your, your net take home pay would be 180 something less than $60, which is about 120 something. Commissioner Carr. Commissioner Carr, my question is, um, uh, at the time, would you say the average soldier would agree with your assessment of the conditions of service in the Army? Again, I think that is a quick sort of individual perception. What I believe to be okay and what you believe to be okay may be quite different. Life is a question of perspective and is also relative. So, but by and large, 
you know, that was, that was what was available. And then anybody joining the army would have known that these are the conditions. And then you are coming to, to take what was available. In other words, this is a young man who is not employed. You know, he wants a job, and that is what is available. You know, the soldiers then also were, were, were at secondary school leavers. So you compare the, the relative earning, you know, your capacity to earn more in another employment to what you have. If it is below what your qualifications are, then by all logic, then you, you will be dissatisfied. But if you, if you know that you know, your potential to earn something is, is not better than what you are, then you take it. Thank you. Commissioner Kinte. Commissioner Kinte. Um, Cham, well, Commissioner I Imam. I, rem I remember um, you said the Nigerians uh, as it is obvious, people have objective and subjective issues. The objective of having them here was to train, build the capacity of Gambians so that Gambians will take ownership. And the subjective part, if I understand, would be that uh, the Nigerians may drag their feet on all the activities for them to stay longer and enjoy the facilities while the Gambian team will be more and more disgruntled because uh, they have not been uh, fast tracked to to k take their responsibility is that valid no i think the nigerians came here on a very specific and concrete agreement between two sovereign states who all understood very clearly what you wanted and based on those terms which i was not privy to I think the time of stay would have been specified. And then there was also within it some mechanisms with which to review at periodic stages whether the objective is being achieved, whether the personnel that were deployed were fit to the task, and then if at any one point in the view of the receiving party, which was then the Gambia government, it was their feeling that, you know, they, they are not getting what they, uh, what they bargained for. I think there was also within the mechanism, which I don't know, uh, you know, a clause, an exit clause, where they can, they can terminate or change the, the composition or whatever. Thank you. Imam C. Mala Kobisona, Imam C. Chao mang lai la Nigeria ni la lingen don leka nyomi tam lola nyon leka yena bokon benda wai nyarel bi tam nyom nyata la nyon aki tam la nyom nyop nyolen telefon wai la yeni tam amge enjing en telefon. Do I answer in English or I use Wolof? Please answer in English. Well, I think his question is whether we were eating the same food with the Nigerians. No, the Nigerians had their own feeding arrangements. But if we are on field exercise, then we all eat the same. The second question was how many were the Nigerians? I think the, the records are there. I cannot I can remember exactly how many of them were deployed in the country. But certainly they were above 20-something, if I remember. If I the understand the mm. question correctly, mm. I think the imam inquired whether there were any Nigerians under your responsibility. That's, I think that's what the imam said. Yes, certainly. I think he asked three questions. Yeah, and uh, I was going to that bit. In, in the military hierarchy, it is rank, appointment, and title. So whether you are a British soldier or a Canadian soldier, if you are in any situation where you, you, you live together, rank takes precedence. The officers who are superior to the, to the government officers, you know, would, would take precedence. 
those of the officers that were superior to some of the Nigerians, because they also had some lieutenants. So we would also, you know, defer to the Gambians. The NCOs certainly, you know, would take command if they fall within your, your own setup from the Gambians. So this is military ethics, and these are the, you know, the, 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 the es essence of uh, regimentation. And the third question? Yes, yes, okay. uh, thank you very much, um, uh, General Cham. You made a few references to SOFAL, Status of Forces Agreement. Are there any copies um, uh, that the Gambia concluded, or um, of the SOFAL that the Gambia concluded with the Nigerian government that uh, we can have access to? I don't want to preempt um, uh, the uh, legal counsel or the legal team on this issue. But uh, if uh, SOFA concluded with the Nigerians, a copy is available, would want to see it. Uh, we are looking for it. Uh, we would uh, surely get copies and provide them to the commission. Please. Well, as I said, these were state agreements. And at the time, my level didn't allow me to have access to those, uh, you know, sensitive uh, intergovernment agreements, but suddenly, you know, in the in the in the natural sequence of dealing between two sovereign states, I think there would exist a memorandum of understanding, if not a sofa or a note verbal, which will clearly state the parameters and the responsibilities, the obligations, and the immunities that you know would be enjoyed within the context of our. This thing, modern, you know, what we call uh, rule-based international system. Fine. We'll get to that point a bit later on whether or not it's just exchange of letters or a proper sofa. We'll examine that a little bit later and see which and which one uh, they concluded. If we can have copies of that for our uh, information. Any further questions from commissioners? If not, we will take a 30-minute break and come back at uh, 12 noon. Thank you so much, General. Welcome back, everyone. Shall we resume? Uh, we have 90 minutes to go, legal counsel, and uh, we are in your hands. Please proceed. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Welcome back, General Cham. I hope uh, you have had the chance to rest a little bit. Very well, Lead Council. Uh, before the break, you were talking about, uh, perhaps I should first of all remind you that you're still on the oath. Before the break, you were talking about the conditions that prevailed within the army and uh, how satisfied were Gambian soldiers and officers about the situation. Uh, and the last question you were dealing with concerned uh, the perception by the junior officers regarding the training that took place in, in Kudang. Uh, in May of 1994. Do you recall that? Very well. Now, tell us, uh, do you remember or do you know where Lieutenant Yankuba Ture did his officer's training? Very well. Uh, I think I did mention that at some point in my career, I was the adjutant of uh, the then one infantry battalion on the Conan Daunjai. And uh, like the, the, the system was such that whenever there is a need to promote officers, a commission selection board would be set up. Uh, and uh, those who had the most or the best academic qualifications, with a minimum sometimes of at least a three or four O levels, would be selected and then they go through the, the selection board. So those of them who makes it up will be promoted to the rank of cadets and then subsequently sent for their follow-on officer training. 
out of every batch, naturally there would be some who, do, who will not make it. So it was during such period that at one, day, one, one of the days, we had an urgent offer from the United States Embassy that we have two slots for this IOBC in Fort Benning. So the period was too short to organize another officer selection board. So we went through the files and then shortlisted out of those who didn't make it in the first rounds, three. One was Yankuba Ture, who was then a sergeant. The other was Lance Corporal Sana Sabali. And there was also one private, Aplai or Aliuba. And were they eventually sent for training? Yes, so they were. Eventually, we settled on uh, Sergeant Yankuba Ture and Lance Corporal Sana Sabali. And then they were decorated by myself and Commandant Daunjai, and then they were sent to the United States for their basic officer training. And that would be Fort Benning, correct? Yes, please. So now we have Yankuba Ture and Sana Sabali, they went to Fort Benning, right? Yes, sir. And Lieutenant Edward Singate, where did he train? Lieutenant Edward Singate, if I can remember his badge, uh, it was during my time as adjutant that he was recruited. And then I think he was subsequently shortlisted for officer cadet, him and his brother Peter, together with, uh, I think, the present CDS, uh, Lieutenant General Masane Kinte, and some other officers, and I think civilians. So the, the board was composed of myself, a British officer, and uh, Sellers, Sergeant Major Sellers, and maybe one or two other officers, which I can remember now. The, the question is, where did he go for officer training? Well, he, was, he, was, he went to Sanders. And uh, Lieutenant Alaji Kante at the time, where did he go for training? Well, correction, I think I stand to be corrected on where Lieutenant Edward Singate went for training. But Alayi Kante was also among those who had attempted earlier on the, CD, the CSB, but couldn't make it on the first attempt. And then I think subsequently he had another chance and then he made it through. Uh, thank you for that answer. Uh, Mr. Witness. But the question is, where did Kante go for his officer training? Kante, if I can remember, went to Sanders. So here we are. We have Kante and Singate. They both went to Sandhurst, correct? As I said, for Singate, I stand to be corrected. I have to refer back to the files. But suddenly, I think Kante went to. But those, are in the, those details are in the files, and we can check them. And Sabali and Ture went to Fort Benning. That's correct. So this group comprised of officers, who went, some of whom went to Fort Benning, and others went to Sandhurst. That's correct. What do you say to the suggestion that this group of junior officers all agreed that the training that was delivered by the Nigerians at Kodang was not good enough, in spite of the fact that they trained from different military academies? I'm not sure whether four young officers out of all the officers, young officers, in the then Gambia National Army would constitute a representative sample of the then National Army. I appreciate that, Mr. Witness, and we're not making that suggestion at all. Um, but uh, you did answer that the criticism that was leveled against the Nigerians for the quality of their training stemmed from the fact that uh, these officers had different military trainings 
and uh, there was this issue. Uh, you teased each other on the basis of the fact that some trained in Sandhurst and some trained in the U.S., and that you believe that the training in the U.S. was higher. But this group of officers, because they trained in the British system or the U.S. system, criticized the Nigerians for their training because the system was different. What I'm now trying to show to you is that among those officers who met that evening in Kodan and talked about or criticized the Nigerians for the kind of training they were offering, they did not train from one particular tradition or from one school. They trained from different traditions and different schools. So how do you reconcile that with your answer? Again, I would say and insist that it's a question of uh, subjective perception. There were some officers who were trained in Pakistan, and uh, I think they were also very qualified and efficient officers. And then they were also within, and they were not hard to criticize the system. So if four out of all the officers you know, came up with that conclusion, which was not articulated loud enough you know, for corrective actions to be made then, then I will take it that, well, maybe that was a private perception, which was not shared with the chain of command, and then for, for corrective remedies. Uh, thank you very much for that answer. But in your view, as a su su superior officer, uh, was that complaint legitimate? As I said, in the army, the system is that if a junior feels that something is not going according to what he thinks is the right way, there is an avenue for him to make his opinion known via the chain of command, and then you know, a panel or his immediate commander would adjudicate. And if it is found to be something objective and based on concrete facts, remedial measures will be taken. That is certainly the procedure for making complaints in the army. But the question I ask is whether the grievance that those officers had at the time, whether that grievance was legitimate in view of the facts or wasn't it? By and large, I think it was not legitimate. Uh, we have heard that uh, the political situation that existed at the time in 1993 and 1994 badly affected the soldiers uh, in the Gambia National Army. Would you say that that assessment is correct or not? Well, nothing that I know of. Again, you know, individuals form their own opinions based on their background and the circles in which they, they move on. But certainly, to my own knowledge, the majority of the Gambian officers, and that includes the likes of myself, you know, were busy with what our constitutional role and mandate was, and certainly we had no cause, you know, to be to be to be uh, to, 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 to be dissatisfied with, you know, what we saw as the objective realities then in the country. Uh, would you agree to the suggestion that as the most senior Gambian officers at the time, uh, you were out of touch with what was happening to the rank and file? No, because in my own uh, distinct summary of my career, I think I was all the time with the men. Starting from second lieutenant, I was with a platoon moving up to a company. And just a month before my, redepo uh, before my redeployment to the army headquarters, I was a company commander in Farafenye. So I was very well aware of the situation with both the officers and the men under command. But physical presence does not necessarily mean 
that you are aware of everything that is going on within the group. Is that correct? Well, knowledge of everything, omnipotence, I think, is the realm of the gods. But certainly, within the parameters of my job, I was aware of the, the state of uh, mind and morale of the troops under command. But the group in Kudang, three of your company commanders were alleged to have met together that night and expressed amongst themselves dissatisfaction uh, as to how the Nigerian uh, officers were conducting the training, and you were not aware of it. I think we will correct the, that statement. They were not company commanders. They were platoon, platoon commanders. commanders. Platoon commanders within your own company, people who worked directly and immediately below you, uh, all three of them converged together and discussed their dissatisfaction about the training that was offered by the Nigerians, and you were not aware of it. When you say my company, you are meaning the company that I was commanding. This yes. was an exercise scenario. And then troops were drawn from across all the seven members. So it was a composite this thing. It was not the, 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 an integral company from one unit. It was composed of different elements and brought together and formed into companies. So at that time, both Sana Sabali and uh, Lieutenant Singate were posted in Yundum. It was only Yankubature who was with us in Farafenya. Uh, thank you very much for that clarification. What I'm trying to drive at is, since you talk about it, it's about perception. What I'm trying to drive at here is that there was a difference in perception by those who were higher up, including yourself, and those who were immediately below you, the, the, the lieutenants and the second lieutenants. Would you agree to that assessment? Well, I think if I may come back to this, the three was not representative of the, was not a representative sample of the officers. So in any military situation, a barrack situation, you have what we commonly refer to as barrack lawyers or rubber rousers. So these are elements or uh, soldiers or officers who feel that they know. And most of the time, you know, they, they take pride and probably in their own perception, they endear themselves to their fellows by, you know, trying to raise some criticisms on any situation. So I would classify them as rubble rousers then. Well, you seem to equate lawyers with rubble rousers. Uh, that's not a very <laughs> nice compliment of us, but uh, <laughs> yeah, we, we, we would leave it at that. Uh, but what I'm trying to drive at here is that um, it's not just those three officers. Uh, I gave you the example of those three officers to show that these three officers worked directly under you. And during that period they did, they take steps to suggest that their position or their views were completely different from yours. Uh, but if you look at the information that is available, there were more officers who, were, who appeared to be dissatisfied with the presence of the Nigerians. So uh, what I want to establish is whether there was a difference in opinion by the more senior officers as compared to the officers below them. I think my honest answer is that, you know, these are nationalistic sentiments. And any time that, you know, a foreign, a foreign party comes to occupy some responsible positions in another country, naturally there would be resentment, there would be, you know, uh, uh, criticisms, and then I think this was no exception. So, so you would now agree that such was the case, there was resentment and criticism of that particular state of affairs? Again, I would refer to my previous answer, that it was not very loud, if they were under current, maybe they were within, but certainly not something that will be so obvious for any reasonable person not to understand. Uh, now, can you tell us 
uh, where you were on 22nd July 1994. As I said, when I was redeployed from Farafeni, I was posted at the Army headquarters as SO2 operations and training, and then I was answerable to the colonel, G G colonel responsible for operations and training. And then within that week, I think we had information that there would be a visiting American naval ship, and that they wanted to exercise their troops jointly with some elements of the Gambia National Army. And uh, for that matter, we needed to prepare operations orders to create a scenario and then some sort of a workable exercise plan. It was, uh, I was involved in those preparations. And what was going to be the nature of this exercise? If you can tell us just the bits that you can discuss publicly. I think the scenario was going to involve some some of the Navy, the then Marine Marine units and the visiting American uh, Marine troops converging around the Denton Bridge on the Seracunda end of the bridge, you know, at around 9 or so. And then from there, they will be trucked to the exercise general area of uh, Mandinari, where, of course, the Yundum troops would have been uh, marshaled, and then the, the exercise will roll on. So this was this, the, the operation that was planned. Okay, and that morning did you go to work? I woke up on Friday the 22nd of July and it put on my uniform and headed towards uh, Westfield where I usually pick up a public transport to go to Banjul. When I reached Westfield, this was around 7.30 going to 8.00. You know, there was no vehicle. There was scarcity of vehicles. And then, you know, most of the vehicles that were heading to Banjul eventually were, were returning back. So I stayed a bit of time there before I had a pickup. And uh, who did you eventually join to go to Banjul? As I stood there, Captain Ibrahim Akambi drove in his private vehicle. And then I think he was with... Uh, Captain Wilson, Ben Wilson, they picked me up at that point. What happened after they picked you up? Well, we headed to Banjul, and uh, around Steam Corner, the traffic started to, 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 to dense. And then at some point, we were moving very slowly. We decided that, you know, we should, uh, Kambi should drive on the, on, the, on the edges of the road so that we can fast track our, our movement. So he did, and then about 200 meters before the bridge, we were stopped by a group of soldiers with weapons from Yundum, and then they were not in very uh, orderly manner, but they had guns, and then they were in effective control, and they sealed the Serekunda end of the Dentin Bridge. Were there any officers present at the time? I didn't see any officer then. No, not my encounter didn't. I didn't encounter any officers. Here you are in this vehicle with Captain Kambi, Captain Wilson, yourself, Captain Jata. Who was the most senior captain amongst you? I think some little bit of correction. Uh, captain Jata was not at the vehicle then, but when we were stopped by the soldiers, they told us that there was a military coup going on and that we should report to their officers at Yundum. And then they, they named Sanasabali and uh, Lieutenant Singate. Um, who was the most senior captain amongst you at the time? When they gave us those, uh, those, uh, those orders, we, we decided that we should, we should turn back and then head towards uh, Fajara Barracks. As we wheeled the vehicle to join the other lane, then we saw Captain Jata, Babukar, or, and then Lieutenant Alpha Kinte. So they flocked us, and then we let them in, and then we, all of us proceeded to Fajara Barracks. Who was the most senior officer amongst you? I think by rank, Captain Jata or Wilson was most senior, 
I cannot remember specifically, but in the order of our, our, our commissioning and promotion, it was Jata or Wilson Jata, then myself, Kambi, and then Lieutenant Alpha Kinte. Uh, who amongst you spoke to the soldiers you found at the bridge? I think Kambi or Wilson spoke to them, but later Jata also was able to tell us that the, the soldiers have sealed the bridge. He's, he's been told the same message with us. At this stage, was any of you armed? No, we were not armed. Did you comply with the order that was given by the soldiers who sealed the bridge? Yes, we had no option, so we decided that instead of going to Yundum, we should fall back to Fajara Barracks, which we assume at that time was still under 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 loyal command, so that when we go there, we can join you know the officers, the gendarmerie officers or the tactical support or, or group officers who were there, and see what we what we are going to do with the situation. Uh, what time did you arrive at the bridge? We arrived at the bridge at that time of around 9.30 or 9 somewhere, going to 10. I, 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 I definitely don't remember the exact time. Can you tell us what the situation was like around the bridge? I think there was commotion, there was panic, because most of the commuters who were heading to Banjul were either blocked, those of them who were not patient enough to wait were torn in, at their various points to, to head back to, to, to Serekunda. And then, you know, the, the group of soldiers that we encountered completely sealed us, and we didn't know what, uh, about 200 meters from the bridge, so we couldn't see what deployment was on the bridge. What was the, their posture uh, the, of the soldiers you found sealing that, that end of the bridge? I think their posture was, uh, was very 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 aggressive because you know naturally as soldiers when you deploy them on life operations you know uh, in a in a coup certainly it was it was not you know a party so it meant you know they 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 had orders that you know they they would go along with whatever orders they were given how were they dressed the regular gna cabo with some weapons and some some magazines with their weapons also loaded with uh, weapons uh, with magazines, which I assume with life rounds as well. Would you say that they appeared battle ready? Yes, they were in battle order. And uh, you left the bridge, and you said you headed to Fajara Barracks. Yes, we headed to Fajara Barracks. By the time we reach the gate of Fajara Barracks. Why Fajara Barracks instead of Yindum Barracks? Because at that time, as, uh, as officers, we didn't want to jump into a situation that we didn't know. And uh, because these soldiers who regularly would have obeyed and respected you as a senior officer were now giving you orders, you know, there was, <laughs> there was not the norm. So we said, well, if that is a mutiny, and then we were not in the loop, we were not part of it, it was better to try and locate, you know, elements that were still loyal to the then government and then see what we do about it. And so you went to Fajara Barracks. Tell us what you found at Fajara Barracks. At Fajara, we met that the camp has already fallen. And then we met another set of soldiers manning the main gate to the barracks. And then they also ordered and advise us that we should now head to Yundum to answer to their commanders. At this stage, who was in charge of Fajara Barracks? Well, I don't know. All I know is that they were under the hands of a group of soldiers who came from Yundum. The senior commander or the NCO at that moment, I don't know. Um. This group of soldiers, were, all, were they also part of the coupists or not? Yes, they were. That, that was our assumption. Because they drove from Yundum. They, they drove from Yundum. Some went to, 
to to the bridge others went to neutralize uh, Fajara Barak. so then definitely they were part of the group uh, what did you do after you left Fajara Barracks? We decided against going to Yundum again. And then we remember that uh, the colonels, Colonel Awonibi and Akoji, were living in Koto. And uh, at that time also, the then designated commander of the National Army, General Dada, was away in Nigeria. So we decided to go to the residence of these colonels and uh, maybe see what else can we do. The people you just mentioned would have been the most senior commanders of the Gambian National Army at that time, correct? Yes, at that moment, yes. In rank, they were the most senior. And uh, they were not only most senior, but they also had the most important command positions, correct? Yes, certainly in the army, rank takes precedence in the hierarchy. So in the absence of the commander, the next senior in rank will assume the responsibility of command. They also had responsibility for operations of the Gambian National Army, correct? Well, again, I will state here that I didn't know the specific details of the MOU or the note verbal that was signed between the government of the Gambia to designate the line of command. But certainly I know that Dada was appointed as the commander and in the, in the military hierarchy, you know, the most senior officer, as I said earlier on, will take over when in the absence of his superior. You remember you testified earlier that one of them was commander of operations, correct? Certainly, you know, if to, uh, the, in, in, in the military order, if the commander is away, the, the operations, uh, the guy responsible for operations takes precedence over the admin and would assume the command. And uh, is that the reason why you decided to go meet them instead of going to Yindum? Yes, that is correct. So uh, did you find them at their residence at Kotu? Yes, we did. When we reported, uh, they briefed us on the information they had about the situation in Yundum and what they were able to glean from their communications with their other feeders. Can you share that information with us? Well, they told us that, you know, some elements of uh, the soldiers with some junior officers at Yundum had beaten it earlier that morning. Uh, con uh, arrested some officers, seized the Amori key from the adjutant, and then opened the Amori, armed the rest of their this thing, uh, their, 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 their sub uh, uh, supporters, and then had moved on to take the bridge, the, the bridge, Denton Bridge, towards Banjul, and which we confirm. Do you recall what time you arrived? at uh, the house of the colonel in Kotu? I think this was upwards of 10 going to 11 in the morning. Having received that information, what did you do? Then naturally, you know, as uh, officers, we, 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 we looked at the situation and then discussed on what to do. Then it uh, we, 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 we decided that we should uh, contact the CEO at two infantry battalion in Farafenye, who was Colonel Salik, and then ask him to mobilize the soldiers and the officers, arm them, and then give them conveyance to head towards Bara so that they can cross to reinforce the soldiers from the Banjul, uh, in Banjul then. Um, before all that happened, did the Nigerian commander of operations, who was that now the de facto commander of the army, did he take charge of the situation to deal with it? Well, yes, by all intent and purpose, given that, you know, uh, he was restricted to his house and then whatever 
leverage he had was being exercised via the landline, the telephone. You know, I think, yes, he, he took charge of the situation. Did he do anything to exercise command? As I said, he, he called Colonel Salik at Farafene, and then, as I said, instructed that the Gambian soldiers and officers be mobilized, armed, and then, you know, loaded on the trucks to take the route to Barra. Did he immerse himself into the problem as commander, or did he wash his hands off it as a Gambian affair? I think along the, 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 the uh, whilst we were there going through it, it uh, naturally dawned on us that this was going to be certainly viewed as an internal Gambian affair, and that, you know, even whereas at that time, command responsibility would naturally fall onto him, they were being careful to really take charge of soldiers and venture into a military operation then. In a sense, that is a nice way of saying, he said, hands off, we Nigerians, you Gambian officers, take charge of the situation, correct? I think that point would come later. But from that point up to the time that maybe your subsequent questions will, will reveal, he was sort of supportive, advising, and then coordinating. At what point did he say, if at all he did, um, say this is a Gambian matter, you, you Gambian commanders take care of it? I think when we give those instructions to, to Colonel Salik, troops were mobilized on the... Captain Jiba, who was the most senior Gambian officer, Sam Jiba. And then among the platoon commanders were Lieutenant Samper Mendi, late now. There was also Lieutenant Yankuba Ture. There was also Lieutenant Vincent Jata. And the complement of senior non commissioned officers and soldiers that were formed up. Exactly the number, I don't know, but a detachment, a group of soldiers were eventually mobilized. And then I think we also had a problem of transportation. When the critical moment came to load them into trucks, the army truck that was there, or the army trucks that were there, was not functional. So what did you ask them to do? We then ordered them to get to the town of Farafene, and then commandeer available trucks and use them as convenient, conveyance to Barra. Do you know whether they did that? Yes, certainly they did that. And then they eventually boarded some uh, vehicle trucks or whatever, with buses. I, I, I didn't know the details of that, but they were conveyed to Barra. And this group was coming from Farafene, and they, they eventually arrived in Barra, correct? Yes, eventually they arrived in Barra. I must also state here that when they left Farafene, because of uh, the lack of radio communication means, then we were not able to, to monitor them and then to, to, to see their progress from Farafene to Barra. So eventually, when they came, I think I learned that they arrived late at Barra, uh, around six or so, and then at that time the ferry was no, no longer operational. So do I understand you to mean that there was no communication equipment that would enable you to communicate with the troops during their trip from Farafene to Barra? Is that correct? No, there was no communication equipment because, you know, the infantry or the army, depends on uh, HF and VHF radios for military operations. And then based on the, on the composition, 
and they will have various ranges of communicating. But certainly, a base station would have been established between Army headquarters and Farafene, but the complementing sets of radios, you know, that the operation commanders will carry in the field was not there. Uh, do you know whether the Nigerian commander at Farafene went with the troops? No, they didn't. None of the Nigerian soldiers from Farafene uh, followed the soldiers, the Gambian soldiers, to, to, uh, to Bara. At, which, at what stage did you realize that the Nigerians did not wish to be involved? Whilst we were there, again, I think we were also trying to make telephone calls and find out. And then the, the operation, uh, the, the, the colonel that I mentioned earlier on, had also some calls to the then commander of the marine unit, Major Antuman Saho. And then at around 2, 2.30, well, we realized then that uh, the then president, through Antuman Sao had already abdicated, what I would say, abdicated the seat of government and had uh, uh, gone into the visiting American ship. My question really was, at what stage did you realize that the Nigerian commander did not wish to be involved in what was considered an internal Gambian matter? I think from the time we mobilized the troops from Farafene, you know, and the subsequent this thing, we realized that, you know, as the event unfolded, you know, they were naturally being careful. And then certainly, you know, they, 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 they didn't take it up as a national call then to, 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 to get involved in what was seeming to be a, a, an internal Gambian affair. Did they tell you that they were not to be involved in an internal Gambian matter? Well, explicitly not word, not in words, you know, but as uh, mature and sensible officers, you know, you, you gauge the enthusiasm with which people approach tasks, especially in an emergency situation like that. And then we, we subsequently, you know, advise ourselves that, well, these people will, will not be going to fight to, to restore the civilian government. Uh, what was the net effect of such lack of enthusiasm by the Nigerian commanders of the army? Well, as I said, you know, when the commander is not very enthusiastic, then initiatives you know, will, not be, will not be very many. So ultimately it dawned on us, the Gambian officers, that you know, maybe this was outside their mandate and that if there is going to be any solution to the situation, it must emanate from us. Would you say that at this stage there was a break in the command structure of the army? Yes, certainly. There was a complete break in the command and control structure from, from the early morning. Because as I said, at Yundum, which was then the most important military deployment, the commander was a Nigerian and uh, we learned that he was uh, he, he was uh, he was then in his house, was unable to to report, and then the the Gambian officers who were there, you know, were either locked, the ones at least the 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 coupes perceived to be any threat to them, they were locked, and then there was there was no there there was no uh, identifiable chain of command then. And there was no identifiable Gambian officer who could take command of the situation at the time. No, from our past, from our corner, then I think 
we knew, we, as I told you, we had the seniority. We know who was senior, but certainly we, this was an operation sales now, and uh, the, anybody was free to make an input. Apart from the three or four captains who were present there, is there any, was there any Gambian officer who was senior to you? I think, yes, at that time, if I remember very well, uh, Major Chris Davis was the most senior Gambian officer. And then I think he was appointed as the battalion 2IC in Yundum. I stand to be corrected on that. But yes, in country, Major Chris Davis was the most senior Gambian officers, officer. And then by, by, by rank also, Major Antoman Saho was also senior. He was at the Marine Unit. And uh, the rest of the senior ranks were Captain Aplai Conte, who was on military training in the U.S., and Captain Omar Fai, and then Babu Karjata and Wilson, in descendant order like that. Uh, would you agree that when the Nigerians relinquished command or relinquished uh, the responsibility to address the situation, it created a command vacuum in the structure. Certainly, yes, at the, at the, at the army level there was a command vacuum. Uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, let's now proceed with what happened after you spoke to uh, Major Antuman Saho at around 2.30. What happened after that? When we spoke to him, he informed us that then President Sadaud Jawara and some of his cabinet ministers, I think it included the vice president, Sehu Sabali, or the finance minister, Bakari Bunja Dabo, and uh, I think later on, the then IGP, Inspector General of Police, Pasa Lajain, all boarded the ship and some other ministers and other senior government civil servants. Having received that information, what did you decide to do next? Well, we, 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 we thought then that, you know, there was no political leadership in the country because in, according to the constitution, which I later referred, you know, the president was then the commander in chief. And then even whereas he was a civilian, I think his, uh, his duty to the state required that if an emergency comes in, he should take leadership of the situation. And then since he had most of his senior advisors at the military, then in Banjul, oh, we thought that as a minimum, there should have been some announcement to the nation to inform the general citizenry of the situation, and then also to, 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 to declare it as illegal, and then to order not only the security forces, but all Gambians to, to, uh, to, to start uh, to, to, to do whatever they can do to stop it, which didn't happen. And then I think when the soldiers at the bridge and then along the way to Banjul learned that, you know, there was a vacuum in the political leadership, then there was this imp imp implosion of the security of the state. And then when we got the message that he has boarded the ship, uh, the Nigerian colonel then turned to us and said, well, young officers, this is a critical moment in the destiny of the country, and then it is up to you to go and see what you do with the situation. And what kind of advice, what did you understand him to mean when he said to you, you go and take care of the situation? I think at that time, we had a fair view of the characters who were leading the coup. So can, what, you, can uh, you explain what that means, a fair view of the characters? Tell us about these characters and what you understand, what you understood they were like at this stage. I think at that time, based on the information we had, we knew that Lieutenant Sana Sabale was very critical. Lieutenant Edward Singate was very critical. E.I. Jamme was also very critical. For Edward, 
we, we thought that he was a RAS officer. Rush. Yes, he was. R A S H. As Rush. Rush, Rush officer, yes, please. And then, you know, he, he was adventurous and then had a little bit of an exaggerated sense of ego and importance. Yaya Jame? For, for Yaya Jame, quite honest, I didn't know much about him because he was coming from, from, from the uh, Zandarmari. And then the little encounters I had with him was that, well, in our military standards, he was not a very fine-tuned officer. And then intellectually also, well, he had a little bit of, you know, logical deficiency. How about discipline? Well, discipline, uh, I think he was, he, was not, he was not what you call a well-mannered and comported officer. Yankubature? Correction, Yankubature was not on that, at that, uh, at the, uh, uh, around that area then. Yes, but all, nonetheless, we still want to know what? how you officers, senior officers, perceived him at the time. Before I get to Yankuba, I'll go to Sana Sabali. Sana, very well. Yes, Sana Sabali was, let's say, not very disciplined. He had this propensity to to, to, to get annoyed and agitated quickly. And then, you know, if somebody is not very composed, most of the time you, you don't make rational decisions. Then... Maturity? Maturity, no, he was not mature by all standards. He was a, just a small uh, boy, you know, in, who has been trusted to, 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 to a, to a, to a rev level and uh, responsibility that you know, was not, he was not well prepared for. Yanku Bature? Well, from my, 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 my experience with Yankuba, I think he was a very, what I would call, pliant officer. Somebody who will, who will, who will, who will, who will try to, to please you and then, you know, uh, <laughs> be subservient to you. He was not the kind of officer who will challenge, you know, he will, he was very pliant. He was a sneaky character, of course. Whatever you tell him, <laughs> well, he, he complies. So that was my own perception of him. Haidara? Again, Haidara, I didn't know. Because Haidara was not in Yundum. And then, because later I learned that he, most of his childhood he spent in Sierra Leone. So there was no opportunity in which uh, we had any encounter before July 22nd. Interesting group of characters, would you agree? Certainly. So at after around 2.30, your Nigerian commander abdicated responsibility and tell you, well, you Gambian officers, go and sort out the situation. What did you do? I think when he said that, then we, we looked at ourselves and then I, 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 I volunteered that I will go to the ground. Jata volunteered as well. Ba uh, that is Captain Bawakar Jata. Captain Wilson, Captain Kambi, and Captain, uh, Lieutenant Alpha Kinte excused themselves for personal reasons. Did they say which personal reasons? No, they didn't, but at least they were not comfortable going into an unknown situation, and uh, I think for self-preservation, uh, they, they didn't want to go with us. And uh, what did you do with Babakar, the two of you who decided to go and uh, deal with the situation? We had no vehicle, so we pleaded with Kambi to drive us to the Senegambia Beach Hotel area, where we, we persuaded one of the local tourist taxi drivers to drive us to Banjul. Did you encounter any difficulty arriving in Banjul? No. There was no stop. There was no checkpoint. We drove from Senegambia via this battle hardened highway, and then, then to Westfield, and then straight to the bridge. At the bridge, we, we, we cross. At Bond Road, we, 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 we wheel, 
and then drove to the marine unit where we met Major Antuman Sao. Did you encounter uh, any soldiers at the bridge? Suddenly they were not blocking the bridge anymore. They were not, there was no deployment of soldiers, I think. If there was any, it, were, it would have been the regular ones who are going and coming, but not any military uh, checkpoint or so. And uh, do you recall what time you arrived at the Marine unit? I think we, we arrived at the Marine unit a little after three, going to four. I was not very conscious of time, but that was, that was around the same, around the time we arrived at the Marine unit. Tell us what happened when you arrived there. When we arrived at the Marine unit, we went to Major Saho's office. And then he, he, he told us, he confirmed what we have earlier learned, that the soldiers have uh, taken over State House, the then president and most of his senior, this thing has uh, have boarded the, the visiting American ship, and that he was visited by, at some point, by Sana Sabali, and then uh, I think it was Lieutenant, Second Lieutenant Edward Singate. And then at that time, he was under compulsion uh, to, 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 to comply or to behave himself. What do you mean by that? Well, at that time, the de facto command of both the, 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 the active soldiers and the state has fallen, has fallen to, to the group of sol uh, officers and soldiers. And then as, uh, he, he, he had no option but to sit where he is and wait for further instructions. And uh, having discussed with him, what did you decide to do next? Well, after that, I decided that we should, we should head to the State House. And then the same driver that took us to the Marine Unit drove us to the, to the Albert Market Gate of the, the State House. Why did you decide to go to State House? Because if I can recollect now, when we were about to leave the Nigerian officers, Colonel Awonibi told me, called me and said, well, you officers must go and ensure that order and order is, uh, is maintained. He told us that, you know, in a situation like what we had in the country, the propensity for, for it to descend into chaos was very great if there is no mature uh, handling of the situation. He also told me that power cannot exist in a vacuum. And uh, as soon as we get there, if it is determined that there is no more political leadership in the country, we should uh, institute a government to take the charge of the destiny of the country. The Nigerians must have been very knowledgeable in these things, in coup d'etats, isn't it? Well, certainly, Nigeria has a very turbulent history from independence to that point. And I'm sure most of the officers who are serving had, at one point or another during their career, witnessed or participated in the toppling of a, of a government by either a civilian government or a military government, and they would have known what these uh, steps would have been. Would you consider that to have been the, just the right advice as to what to do under the circumstances? Well, I think in my, in my, in my philosophical reading, I learned that the first rule in heaven is order. So whether legitimate or de facto, a country cannot, cannot move if there, is, if there is no order. So as a military officer, and then at that critical juncture in our uh, political history, I think our responsibilities was to maintain order and continuity. And you accepted that advice, didn't you? Yes, based on the objective circumstances, I did accept that advice. And uh, what happened when you arrived at State House? When we arrived at the State House, the soldiers who were blocking the gate stopped us and then we introduced ourselves. They went in to call Edward, uh, to call one of the officers, and Edward Singade, Lieutenant Edward Singade, came to us. 
And what happened when he arrived? When he arrived, he told me then that, Captain Chang, where were you? Since the morning, we've been trying to, to get hold of you, and then we didn't see you. We've done this, but we don't know what next to do. He turned to Jatra, Babukar Jatra, and said that he was not needed, and then he should go, go back. He said, we have done this. What did you understand him to mean by we have done this? I think then the situation was that they have toppled the, 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 the Jawara regime and that the country was in their hands. At least the seat of government was in their hands. And that the next step was to, to move forward and institute some mechanisms of a, of a government. Uh, let's get this clear. You understood him to say, to mean that they have now toppled the government, they are now in charge, correct? Certainly. What did you say to him? Well, after saying this, then quote, descendingly he turned to me and said, you captain should have done this before. You should have liberated the country. I told him that, well, that was not you know, uh, what motivated us to join the army and uh, it was not in our, in our planning. What happened after that? Well, we went together to state house, to the in, 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 inside the state house, and then as we were entering where the, uh, the, the gate heading to, to where the office of the vice president is, yeah, I just made a march from the, what I would call the southwestern end of the state house, and then met us on that road. What was his comportment? Well, he was in a very elated mood. He had a uniform and some, some local jujus, which were crisscrossed across his, his uniform. And then I think there was a sense of satisfaction in the achievement that he had at that moment. At this stage, where was Captain Jata? As I stated, he was, uh, he was ordered by Sinate to go back. So then I asked the driver who conveyed us to that point to drop him at the Gambia National Army headquarters and for him to wait for us. Did you ask who was in charge, who organized this coup? I think when we met Siaya and Edward, they then came up and said, the four of them, him, Lieutenant Singate, Second Lieutenant Singate, Lieutenant Yai Jamme, and Second Lieutenant Sana Sabali, together with left, Second Lieutenant Sadebu Haidara, with some unnamed senior non commission officers, were the architects of the coup. Considering that they sent Captain Jata away, what did they need from you at the time? Well, at that time, I think they knew that I was one of the few Gambian officers who, who had the practical knowledge of how to, how to command people. And then because of my, my composure, uh, I had the sense of presence and uh, the realism to understand situations and then to handle them you know in a, in a in a mature form at this stage did they trust that you would join them well certainly they didn't ask me to join them but as i said edward told me they were looking for me so which means you know they wanted some 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 critical advice and input from myself they invited you into state house correct Yes, they invited me in, and then we, we climbed those few steps to the main sitting room from the, from the northeastern end of the main state house building and went into the sitting room. You had discussions with them, didn't you? Yes, as we entered there, and then we sat, and then a group of officers and other ranks started to collate around where we were sitting. So then the practical question of what next to do came. And then... Who did they ask what next to do? Well, as I told you earlier, when Edward encountered me to the gate, he told me very clearly 
that they have overthrown the government, but they don't have any further plan of what to do. And that was why they were looking for me. They didn't know what to do. Those were his words, weren't they? Yes, those were his exact words that were spoken to me. And that was why they brought you in, correct? Well, I think that was part of the reasons they brought me in. At that meeting, could you tell us who else was involved? I was certainly present. Uh, Sam Sudin Sar also was present. What rank at the time? At that time, he was the captain and he was attached to the Ministry of Defense as an SO one at liaison officer at the Ministry of Defense for the GNA. Who else? Uh, Lieutenant Yai Jame was there. Lieutenant Edward Singata was there. I think if my memory serves me very well, I think uh, Lieutenant Suare was also among, probably Captain Sonko, but these were the, the prominent people I can now remember. Can you tell us what happened there? Then we said there is a need to set up a transitional council, and then I coined the, the, the phrase, Armed Forces Provisional Ruling Council, and then as we were deciding on the, on the number that would compose it, well, we settled around 11 people to be made up of six from the Gambia National Army, three from the then defunct Sandar Mari, and two from the police. So that would make a total of 11. Who made that, propos that proposal? Well, when, I, when we agreed on the name, the nomenclature of the council, then it was an open forum. So, but basically, I would say myself and uh, Sam Sar eventually guided that decision because we decided we wanted to have an odd this thing so that in our perception then, whenever the, 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 the council would have been the supreme organ of the state, and that we, we thought that based on you know, the traditions of military rule, there would have been at least, if not, there would have been internal democracy and internal debates, and then whenever an important issue comes, ultimately it will be subjected to a vote, and then the majority, or the simple majority, would carry the day then. Uh, how was that proposal received? Well, by and large, it was OK to the point, but before we could reach on a decision, Sana Sabali, who was away, stomped in and came. And then he expressed dissatisfaction that, you know, being a central member of the group of four that overthrew the government, he was being excluded in a critical and important decision like the setting up of a council. Can you tell us how he described the situation? Well, he was, he was like I said earlier in my earlier discourse, uh, uh, description of him, he was not a well-behaved officer. He was emotional, sentimental, and then sometimes prone to, to anger. Can you describe what he said when he arrived? Well, certainly he disturbed the meeting. Specifically, he stated what I have just said, but any other, any other phrase he may use could have, been, could have escaped me. But I later learned that, you know, part of what he said was monkey will not walk and baboon it. What did you understand that to me? I think... At that time, there was a sense of insecurity in him uh, because, you know, in, in what we were doing, there was no, no plan to exclude anybody, as I have just stated. So there was no concrete decisions. And then maybe he came late to join a discussion, which he was not a party when it started. And then if he had just come and then made himself uh, present and listening, he could have come up with an input, a constructive input, that would have carried the discussion forward. What happened after, his, after he stormed the room and expressed his dissatisfaction about what was happening? I think then we, we, there was a little bit of chaos, and then eventually we asserted that 
Well, yes, it was them who organized the coup. But the affairs of the country was more than any individual. And that in the interest of the country, you know, whether you actively participated or not, the situation on the ground was such that we needed to establish order. Albeit, however temporal it would be, and that in the, in the best interest of our tradition, we should, we should be civil and civilized to, to engage in constructive discussion. So I think that didn't carry any, any sense. And then ultimately, Yai Jame and Edward Singate took him aside and then said they were going to talk to him. What happened after that? After talking to him for some time, they came back and said we should suspend the decision on the council and its composition and get back to practical issues and maybe come back to it later. And uh, was that done? What happened afterwards? Yes, that was done. And then, as I said, the thing was going to around five or so. And then, e eventually, information emerges that some group of soldiers or NCOs were starting to, to head to, on a looting spree. We also had information that there was some mobilization from Senegal heading towards our, our borders. And then we needed to deal with the situation. At this stage, was there any announcement as to what had happened to the country? I was told, I didn't hear it, but they said at one point, the Captain Modu Shonko went into one of the radio stations and made some announcement. But immediately after we agreed on that, I was, I think if it was, if I can remember, either that moment around five, I had an interview with uh, the Radio France International. Why, why you? Well, I think then the situation was that it befell on me to, 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 make, to make some... Uh, when the telephone came, I was not aware. So it was brought in and then I was asked to, to respond to the questions of the journalists on the other side. Who asked you? If I can remember, it was the consensus of uh, Edward Singate and uh, Yai Jamme then. At this stage, uh, did, were, were there any plans as to what the junta would do? As I said, there was no concrete plans at that time. We were about to make a decision on the setting up of our Armed Forces Provisional Ruling Council and uh, determining the membership, which was interrupted. And then this, there was this report that, you know, the, there was some, some threatening developments, both internal and external. And then we, we, we agreed that, you know, for the, for the soldiers, there needed to be some officers who will be tasked to go around and then try to uh, contain them, police them, and that I should also head towards the residence of the then Senegalese ambassador, whom I forgot is something young or so, and then try to get some clarifications on the reports that Senegalese troops were mobilizing and heading towards the country. Did you go alone? Well, I went with a group of soldiers escort. I cannot remember exactly which of the officers joined me, but suddenly, if my memory don't fail me, there were some officers with me, so we drove to the residence in Old Cape Road, Bacau. At this stage, where was Lieutenant Singate? Singate was in State House. Sabali was in State House then. Haidare was there. And then when the meeting broke up, we had multitasking. I think Sabali, Singate were asked to go and verify the reports of... Uh, of this uh, meet, uh, looting, and then some other officers. We left Yai Jamme at State House. How about Samsudin Sar? Samsudin Sar was also there, but I'm not sure at that, at that, at that point he accompanied me to, to Bakao. I stand to be corrected. Um, did you eventually meet the Senegalese ambassador? 
Yes, I did. At his residence, he was not there. Then we turned back, headed towards Banjul. And then after crossing the bridge, on the Banjul end of Dentin Bridge, where the police post normally is, is situated now, I saw his vehicle and flagged him down. Did you talk to him? Yes, I, talked, I spoke to him. I introduced myself and then told him that it was our information that uh, Senegal was uh, massing troops heading towards the Gambian border, and that was disturbing. How did he respond? Well, he never denied or affirmed that. And then I asked where was, where did, where was he coming from? Then he told me he went on a round to drive around Banjul to see what was happening. Did you speak to him again subsequently? Yes, I tried to reason with him. And then I think there was a little bit of hesitancy and reluctance. So I reminded him that this was, at that point, an internal Gambian affairs, you know, which we feel could be handled internally. And then reminded that, you know, we were still conscious of the memories of the July, of the 1981 abortive coup. And that, you know, we would not like a repeat of a situation like that. And then we said, I told him among the other things that, you know, let him convey our, 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 our goodwill to the government of Senegal and then our willingness to take, to discuss issues of common bilateral interest once this dust settles down. And then I judge that that was not also, you know, convincing as well. Did you ask him or inform him that Senegal should not intervene? Yes, after, after this exchange, brief exchange, I, I, I thought I had to scale up the, 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 the negotiation. And then I told him that it is our information and knowledge that there is about 300,000 Senegalese in the country and that if any Senegalese soldier should cross an inch of Gambian territory, we will not be in a position to guarantee their safety anymore. What happened after that discussion? Well, he, he told me that he will convey our message to his government and then will get back to us at some point when he has a reply. Did he come back to you at all? Yes, suddenly, if I can remember very well, around midnight on that night, we had a call from him requesting that we go and get our reply from his residence. You had to go in person, didn't you? At that point, I went with uh, Captain Samsar and Lieutenant Edward Singate together with our, our guards. And what happened when you met the ambassador? What did he say? Well, when we went, there was at least a 30 minutes delay before the gates were eventually open. And then he received us in, in, in his sitting room and that stated, among many things, that they have, he has conveyed our message to the government of Senegal under President Abdou Diouf, and that you know, we should be assured that Senegal was not intending to, to, to invade or to, to in any way participate in the situation that was evolving in the Gambia, and that you know, he, he was willing and ready to to work with us once the dust has settled. Uh, with that information, what did you do next? I think he also gave us the direct telephone number of then President Juf, and then after exchanging pleasantries, we headed back to State House. Uh, what happened after that at State House? When we went, we debriefed the rest of the council that was not there. That's, Edu uh, that's uh, Sana Sabali Ayajame. And then we gave him the number. And then it was already late. I think he tried, but the number was late. So we said that early morning, he will make a call to President Juf. Was that call, in fact, made? Yes, the call was made in the morning of Saturday before we went out. And then, you know, there were 
pleasant exchanges. And then I think even the yeah, Jamais spoke with him in some French, some very uh, some f uh, form of French. And then there was at least an evolving bond then. You received support from Abdujuf at this stage? Well, I will not call it support, but at least we receive understanding that he will remain neutral to the events and that our worst fears of, you know, him deploying Senegalese troops to the country was allayed. Thank you very much for, for that answer. Mr. Chairman, it's 10 minutes to the lunch break. I now cede the floor to the commissioners for questions. Thank you very much, Council, for that, and a thank you, General Chow. General, when you uh, made the switch to go to State House, work with uh, the officers who are now, who have now um, overthrown the constitutional order, did you struggle with balancing perhaps your commitment to maintaining or respecting the constitution of the country with uh, what seemed from your testimony <coughs> to be a motivating factor for you, the existence of, uh, of a power vacuum. Uh, this was perhaps what got you involved with them. Did you, was there any struggle in your own mind how to balance these two things? I think as I stated in my testimony, you know, this was in our appreciation of the, of the situation, a concrete facts have emerged that there was a power vacuum. And then the, the issue was that what was in the, in the best interest of the country? Do we normalize situations and get some semblance of order and continuity? Or do we remain tenacious to, to, to back so, something that was no longer real? So as realists, uh, we, we accepted that de facto there should be a regime. Okay. And then we also, what, I've, uh, what, what I want to state here is that when we started along the way, there was also the possibility, which I will come to later, of you know, reaching out or having some sort of a negotiation with President Jawara, and I am sure in the subsequent this thing, that will emerge. So at that point, personally, I was guided by what in my own perception was in the best interest of the country. Thank you very much, um, uh, uh, Commissioner. Yes, Commissioner uh, Manima, please. Go ahead, Bojang. <coughs> Commissioner Bojang. Mr. Cha, when Edward asked Mr. Jata to Sorry, when Edward asked Mr. Jata that they don't need him, and you asked Mr. Jata to go and stay somewhere around Banyun, did you communicate it to him? Did you communicate to him what uh, Mr. Edward Sartain need? I think this was, he was present. When Edward turned to him and said, we don't need you, go away, I told Edward that no, that was not, that was not respect and that, you know, whatever the situation, Jata was a senior officer and he deserves some respect. So then not to prolong a, a situation that could lead to some uh, <laughs> uh, unforeseen situation, I advised Jata that, yes, he can go and stay at the Army headquarters and then maybe award for, uh, await for the, for the instructions. Thank you. I'm uh, Imam Jalo, Commissioner Jalo, please. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Cham, your other earlier officers who confessed here in this, where you are now sitting, all seem to show that there was dissatisfaction, anger, and dis indiscipline among your young officers. Did you ever make the, offend, uh, the, uh, the attempt as senior officials of the Gambia National Army to convey these feelings and dissatisfactions to the government of the day? There is a system in the army 
which was known as Dorba, which is a forum where under commands will meet at intervals with their commanders. And that any issues of discipline, uh, welfare, or whatever would be aired on those, on those Dorbas. And uh, I can remember very well that where I was posted in Farafenye, we used to have regular Dorbas. And then we used to have this session. Well, the Dorba is a, is a very free, uh, distinct environment. A private soldier can, can stand up and say anything he feels and ask any question he wants. And then it, be, uh, it is, uh, the command is obliged to give answers without any consequences. So I was not posted at Yundum where they were, but I think such, uh, this thing, how do you call it, such forums would have been available to officers. And then I think all the officers would have known that there was a channel in which to convey your grievances or whatever. Thank you, Commissioner Jones. My question is, oh, sorry. did you convey these feelings and thoughts to the government of the day? I think you are asking me whether personally I did convey that. And I said that in my own establishment, before my posting to the, the Army headquarters, which was 2nd Infantry Battalion, you know, I walk under, under a, a commanding officer, which was Lieutenant Colonel Salik. And as a company commander, there were instances where such forums were held. And if these forums are held, there is always a secretary, which is the adjutant, who jots down the questions, the answers, and whatever decisions were made. And then it was also the, 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 the responsibility of the command to convey those to higher, higher command. So specifically, uh, at no point during my career was I directly responsible to communicate to the then political masters. But yes, our inputs and our, our distinct, the, 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 the concerns of our officers were, were conveyed via such forums. Thank you. Commissioner Jones. Commissioner Jones. Thank you, um, General. Um, in your testimony, you explained or you gave us an indication as to where the Nigerians were um, on the day of the coup itself. Do you perhaps by any chance know where the um, U.S. officials were, those who were supposed to take part in the training, as well as um, the Gambia counterparts who were supposed to um, be part of the exercise? Because you had indicated earlier that it was supposed to be in different locations. So do you know what happened to them? And at the, particularly for the U.S. Um, um, counterparts, do you know where they were on the day of the coup? For the, for the troops at uh, Yundum, I think they, they would have been in Yundum, and uh, whatever plans were made must have been abort aborted by the eventual developments. For the American soldiers, they were in their boat. Because, you know, ultimately, you know, when the situation descent into, into chaos, I think they didn't venture out of their boat. And in my subsequent testimonies, I will, I will state to this uh, commission, that at one point their commander actually came to meet us at State House. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Kaur. Commissioner Kaur, I hope with this question I'm not preempting the legal team, but I want to know uh, what criteria was used to distribute positions to junta members as well as recruit civilians into uh, the new administration? I will ask advice from the lead council to, to state whether I can preempt the subsequent testimonies or wait for the appropriate time. Well, the commissioner asks a question. Uh, it's for him to decide whether he wants an answer or not. Uh, but uh, this is something that we would come to uh, in the testimony. So if uh, Commissioner Ka is a bit patient, uh, I'm sure the, 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 the testimony of the witness would cover that point but uh, we are in your hands. I think well said. I, just a, a little summary of what will happen, what I would state. I think one of, one of the criteria then when we managed to set up a semblance of order was that we will cop in some professional you know, uh, civilians you know, with some knowledge or a repute for 
their areas of competencies into the council as ministers. Thank you. Uh, Preempting seems to be um, <laughs> alluded the matter. So, Commissioner Kai, if you don't mind, hold the, hold the question until uh, in the afternoon. Any further questions, Ami? Um, Commissioner Samba? Um, Commissioner Samba, Mr. Cham, I want to ask these questions because since uh, you were in Farafenye, uh, Kudang, and then Bara, where was Yaya Jame? Yes. I think Yaya Jame came to the Gambia National Army following the disbanding of the then Zandarmari. Yaya Jame was a, a Zandarmari officer. So when the then government decided to disband the, the Zandarmari, I think this was consequent upon the breaking of the earlier confederal uh, agreement. Uh, at some point, it was decided that they should now disband the Zandarmari and take some of the officers to either the police or the army. So some of the Zandarmari officers, I think a prominent name which had appeared before the com this commission was AIG Chongan and others who were taken to the police. Yaya Jamme, Sadibo Haidara, uh, if I can remember, Lieutenant Marong, were taken or brought to the Gambia National Army. Oh, Within sorry. that rank, are, are you ahead him or he, he was ahead you? By rank, Yaya Jamme was a subordinate. I was a captain and then he was, I think, a lieutenant. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Council, if you don't have any further questions, we would take a one-hour lunch break and uh, resume our proceedings at half past two. Is that all right? Thank you very much. Um, our meeting is adjourned.